I know there's different ministries and different ways people choose to administer the gift they've been given, the calling, the ministry, the teaching, the perspective, the reality. And I know that sometimes there are people that are good at telling lies or telling fables or stories, you know, to try to make it easier to deal with some fact or some reality. And I know in American culture we're not comfortable with death, so we make up stories about death, you know, so that we're able to handle it better. Though other cultures, children grow up with the whole idea of knowing that death is real. They don't have a problem with it. But in America, because we want to comfort our children, we tell them other things. And I've never really understood that completely, because I always thought that you should teach everyone, anytime, all the time, the truth. Now, I don't mean walk around, you know, blabbing your mouth off about everything that comes into your head about the truth, but I mean the truth about if someone asks you a question, why make up an answer? You know, I, I've never understood that about pastors. I don't understand that about theology. I don't understand that about logic. I don't understand that about science. I don't understand that about pastors. I don't understand that about religion. Why make it up? I have come from a background of studying, especially in Judaism, how rabbis made up answers and made up logic and ways to try to deal with certain things that they didn't understand and came up with the wrong conclusions in the end. So much so that even Jesus himself said, you don't even know who your father is, much less what you know the truth is. If you knew the truth, you would come to me. You would know who I am. You would walk in the light. But instead they had used the scriptures to invent ways to get around and to be found righteous in their own eyes by what they were doing. And I've been hearing lately a lot of just stupid answers from pastors telling people things that technically are correct, theologically, that keeps them safe in their ministry, you know, because, oh, well, you know, of course, you know, that, you know, nobody is going to, you know, be sent to hell, you know, God's going to allow them to go there, or nobody's going to be judged because, you know, they're, they're, you know, homosexual or that they're continuing in that sin because God loves everybody. So, of course, you know, because God loves everybody, we have to adapt the scripture. So we're going to tell you that here's how salvation is and then here's what God has said and then leave it to the reader to decide. And the reader comes off and tells you something like, hey, I'm saying that homosexuals go to heaven. And I'm telling you, no, they don't. You see, I have an answer in the scripture for the reasons why I believe and why I teach what I do. They're very straightforward. There's no problem there. Does a homosexual person go to heaven? No. Quite frankly, they get delivered from their homosexuality by death, if that's what it requires. Because in that moment of dying, no, they will not be a homosexual in heaven. There aren't any. Neither are there whoremongers or all the other adulterers and fornicators and all these other things because their corruption will put on incorruption and their mortality shall put on immortality. So, is there such a thing as Christians who can't get out of their their sexual preferences? Yeah, there's possibilities of that and they need to work on it. But you see, the belligerent person who tells me that there's a homosexual Christian that's exercising homosexuality and is a Christian is in contradiction to the scripture. Because if he isn't already challenged by himself, then he's challenged by the Word of God. If he's not challenged by the Word of God, then he's challenged by those that he's fellowshipping with. If he's not challenged by those who are fellowshipping with, then he's challenged by God himself. It's that simple. Does that mean I have to come out and tell someone they're not going to heaven? No, that's not my choice. Nor is it my calling, my gift, or my ability to tell someone they aren't going to heaven because I don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. Neither do you. God could arrange their life in such a way that they choose to repent or change or do whatever, or they don't even need to. Because quite frankly, at the last moment, they could cry out to God, deliver me, and he would. There's no such thing as this idea that sometimes pastors throw out there that, you know, you have to do baptism, or you have to do this and that and the other thing, and, you know, in order to be saved. And on the opposite extreme, there's no such thing as just accepting all people's actions and behaviors as being acceptable in God's sight. There is criteria. Grace is a criteria. It has a person who's giving it, who has extended it, who has said, this is the criteria with which you will receive grace. 
does Jesus know you? If he does, then you're in him. If he doesn't know you, you're not in him. I'd like to be thinking that, you know, we're in him. Because those that are in him know they're in him. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They know and I'll follow the voice of another. That is the assurance of salvation. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. That is the criteria of who is saved. Do you have the Son? You know if you do or don't. You're talking to him. Or are you? You see, that's where the making up an answer gets into the way of Christianity. Because then you're starting to explain to people how they can feel assured rather than be assured. Because being assured is different than feeling assured. When you want to feel assured, you're going by emotions. When you be assured, you're giving essence to the fact of your faith by way of not just the intellect and the logic of what the scripture says, but also the fact that you have a spirit of God making real the word and your relationship so that you know there's a living God. There's no doubt in your mind. You, of course you're going to heaven. You know it because you know Jesus. But if you don't know him, you aren't. It's that simple. It's always been simple. Do you know me? If you know me, keep my commandments. Period. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples indeed, and that you have love for one another. Are you his disciple? Do you have love for one another? If not, hey, you are. He says so. Deal with it. And the bottom line is, religion keeps raising its ugly head to give explanations for ministers, pastors, teachers, brothers, sisters, deacons, elders, to give some kind of answer they should never have opened their mouth and said in the first place. They should tell the truth in love. Tell the fact. Yes, God loves you. Yes, he's changing you. Yes, he wants you to go to heaven. Yes, he's going to take care of you. Yes, he will change you and make you into the perfect image of his son. Just give it to him. Let it go. Give it to God. Ask. You will receive. That's simple. Seek. You will find. Knock and the door will be open. Keep asking till you get it. Keep seeking till you got it. Make sure that you open it so that you've got Jesus will come in. The point is, you keep going. You don't stop where you're at and say, oh, well, you know, now I want to have somebody come along and whisper in my ear and tell me all the good news, you know, about how, of course I'm saved because I'm participating in this, you know, mega church. Or, of course I'm saved because I'm doing the right thing now. No, there's only one thing that actually assures you of your salvation. It's called Jesus. He's the Word of God. He is the physical, he is the physical manifestation of the spiritual reality of God speaking and he is the living example of the Word of God in the flesh. He is this book that you see right here before you in the flesh, cover to cover. He is the revelation of it, cover to cover. It is fulfilled in him and he is the fulfillment of it completely. It is manifested in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and in the very fact of his being as we see him in heaven. That's it, in a nutshell. So, I don't get it sometimes when I listen to and I watch and I read some of these dumb answers people give each other. And I think, no wonder we're messed up. No wonder people are confused or, in worse ways, abused by the Word of God. Because they're told one thing and they hang on to that one thing, then read more from the Word of God and apply all of Scripture. Because you see, you can't take one part and if it doesn't fit in the rest of the Word of God, it isn't right. You're out of context somehow. You're out of understanding. You're not synchronized with what God has said in His Word. It goes from cover to cover. You don't go, well, I'm going to take you know one line from Genesis 1-1 and I'm going to take one line from John 1-1 and I'm going to say, hey, I'm done. No. Or you don't go to the end of the book and say, hey, I know how the book ends. You know, I, We win, so it's over. That's all i got to do. You won't make it. Sorry. There's more to Christianity than sucking your thumb. There's more to living the life of a relationship with God than just standing around and saying, I'm saved, so what? It bothers me. It really does. Because when they ought to be teachers, when there ought to be men of God, 
with which you could sit down and say ah it's so refreshing to hear the word of god spoken in truth we have need that another come along and teach these men and i see it every day that i'm in ministry because i run into it on a consistent basis the platitude answer the distinctive answer the quote unquote religious answer i mean even in calvary chapels now there's like the religious answer that you know oh well i'm glad that covers that just because the person heard the answer doesn't mean they don't still have the question and they won't ask the next question after that which i do you know a lot of people will tell me oh well you know they'll, they'll give some you know nice quotation from you know certain books of the bible that they they have ready you know they're ready answer sheets you know and it's nice good and you tell me about how you know this applies to you know the age of accountability or how this applies to a person practicing sin today are they saved or not? Do you give them the reality of the distinctiveness of not knowing for sure that you don't know, but God does? Man looks on the outward things, God looks on the heart. It's the determination of the serve the, themselves before God that makes that realization of whether they are saved or not saved. And that, sure, you can quote the scriptures till the cows come home and have all the faith in the world. But guess what? If Jesus says, I don't know you, you ain't there. The point is, it's a relationship and a religion. But the combination of the two must be applied according to the Spirit of God. There's always three parts. You know, and we could get into the... Uh, I want to say in the logic, the statement, the context, and the application, which is what basically Calvary's and other ministries will do. They'll take the statement or the scripture, you could say statement or scripture, and then they'll take the context, and then they'll make the application. And it's a three-part thing. Unfortunately, if you don't make it applicable to the individual person, how that with which the Spirit of God is working in a person's life, does it always fit in the circumstances when a person asks you a question about that? If you don't have the answer, then say, I don't know. Don't always keep quoting some religious dogma, or doctrine, or distinctive, or instinctive idea you have, but rather, if God hasn't given you the answer, for God's sakes, for the sake of the people that are being misled or confused to the nth degree, don't give them an answer that makes them feel good. Give them an answer that makes them be good. Because this feel good and be good has gotten ridiculous to the extreme that no matter how you read the Word of God, you've got someone that'll come along and tell you, Oh, well, let me explain it to you. And in the reality of what the Holy Spirit can do, He can make a person feel good about being convicted. The Holy Spirit can make a person feel good about feeling wrong about what they're doing. The Holy Spirit can very clearly lead a person in the direction they should go because that's what the Holy Spirit's job is in the reality of our life as we examine the Scripture. We're not told to give someone a platitude or to give someone a dogma or a doctrine that makes them feel good or makes them feel bad. We're told to do the things that Jesus said to do. To give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within you, but also to give grace and mercy, to extend grace and mercy to those that are without. To give that answer that has worked with us and then what we don't know, admit we don't know in the learning process that we're still learning. And each and every one of us know in part and we see in part and until that perfection that comes we'll always only know in part and we can only apply in part and so when you see or you hear or you think that you've got it all recognize this you may be misleading all of the people around you without ever really recognizing that you're deceiving yourself in thinking that you know it all when the Bible says that if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all, because in every given set of circumstances and situations in your life, there could be an answer that God is telling you not to use that scripture, not to use that pat answer, not to have an auto response, so that every time you get this certain question, you automatically jack out your certain scriptural answers, and you think that fits. When in reality, God says, that's not really what the person was saying, but you weren't listening. You see, I'm... God. I can see where they're hurting. And this is what's underneath their question. This is where Jesus himself took the word of God and made it applicable in every single individual person that he spoke to. 
There was no one answer that fits all. Every person felt like he was talking directly, specifically to them as the Spirit of God gave him utterance. And that's what we have to be like. We have to not be led by our intellect, our intelligence, our logic, or even our sermon notes, or our distinctives, or our attitudes and actions we think that we've schooled ourselves in theology to be able to do. But we have to also yield ourselves, having laid that foundation, having built that structure, to the person who lives inside that structure we built. And that is God himself living in us. So that God would speak through us to a generation that needs the hope and the answers in any given moment that they could change from eternal damnation to eternal salvation. Because without that realization that every moment of our life is important to a single individual person, then we're always going to go off on a tangent, thinking that we have to give a certain kind of response. We have to make ourselves look good. After all, we're the pastor, the minister, the elder, the deacon, the preacher, the teacher, <clears throat> rather than the fool for Christ, the one who's willing to be made silly for in order that someone else might find God moving in their life and that God can do for that person what you can't give for all that you have in your idea of what you think you should say rather than what God wants you to be, to do, and to live. It's easy to say, oh, well, I'm going to be an example of a believer. And then you go out and you try to be righteous and holy. Anybody can do that. The Jews did that. As a matter of fact, Paul said, as far as the holiness of God was concerned, as far as the righteousness, hey, I was perfect. And yet I failed. As far as the law is concerned, when it came to Jesus, he wasn't perfect. But when it came to the law, perfect. And in this life, you're going to find people that, man, you know, they, they look like they got a perfect life. You know, they got the kid, the car, the job, the scenery, the, you know, toys, the boys, the girls, the, the luxuries, the whatever, the blessings. And yet, that may not be what God wants you to be. He may want you to be the breakings, the necessities, the person who's always in need, the person who's always crying out or needing so that others may be the opportunity to demonstrate the love of God that they have in sharing with you their abundance while you were still in your poverty. Because God uses that too as a ministry unto himself to reveal the hearts and minds of men and women that he has called his own service as well as to demonstrate to the world what the love is among the brethren. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. I saw no temple, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine for it. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine for it. For it. <laughs> For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you, O Lord. Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. I dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Whenever we see error or flesh, we have a choice to make. And so did Noah's sons. One son saw sin of his father, error in his ways, and he went and told his brother rather than dealt with it at the time with God and with him doing the right thing. 
and going to his brethren, his brothers, after being told, went out of their way in every way, shape, form, and possibility to not sin and to not embarrass their father in his sin. And in so doing, earned the favor of the Lord and the blessings from Noah, where the son who did not was cursed. When we run into those same kinds of circumstances with people, we're not called to confront someone's sin, whatever it may be. They know they're in sin. There's no doubt about it. They come to you for prayer. They come for you to be cared for. A person who is hurting isn't looking to be hurt some more by reiterating the fact that they're hurt. In fact, more often than not, what the person is coming for is someone that will listen to how bad they're feeling and give them the answer to what they can do in order to resolve that conflict they have in their life. That conflict we call sin, and it's the basis of everything that's wrong in any person's individual life. Anything that's happening in a person's life, it always boils back down to sin in some way. Whether it be lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, or four other different areas that can affect us. Intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, um, mentally, uh, physiologically, spiritually, epidemi epidemiology, <laughs> epidemiologically, you know, um, hermeneutically, homiletically. <laughs> There's so many avenues with which we can choose to minister, really. You know, you could be a hellfire and preach, hellfire and damnation preacher. I mean, really, you could. But wouldn't it be better, really, if we have the Holy Spirit inside us, who's full of peace, love, and joy, that we have ourselves being a spiritual temple, a uh, manifestation of the temple of God, living and alive in us, that God is dwelling in us, that we say God has come into us. So wouldn't it be easier to just pull from God and let Him speak to those that are hurting and to Him minister to those that are in need than for us to demonstrate our flesh and how smart or intellectual we are or how unwise we are in choosing the wrong statements to say to someone? when Jesus zeroed in what looked like the wrong thing to say to the person and in reality opened up their heart's door that they were like, wow, how did he know? It's real simple how he knew. It's real simple how you can know. And I do it every day. I have to. I don't know. And that's why I have to cling to the Lord in such a way but it's to ask. You see, two people can come up to me in the same venue, the same means, the same problem, the same issue, and say, hey, I got this problem. And I'll say, well, okay, what is it? Well, I like McDonald's, but, you know, I don't have the money to go to McDonald's, so what should I do? Yeah, and I'll say, well, I don't know, let's pray. And I'll pray, and the Lord will say, you know, well, you know does the person have a job, Lord? You know, <laughs> I mean, really, first thought, does the person have a job, Lord? You know, I'll say, well, tell you what, let's go to McDonald's. And I go, oh, okay. And that's what solves the person's problem, right? They wanted to go to McDonald's, so I took them to McDonald's. Another person comes in, you know, he's obviously got money in some way, you know, shape or form, and he says, I got a problem. I say, okay, what's your problem? He says, I want to go to McDonald's. I'll say, okay. Do you want to pray about it? No. Okay, well, what's stopping you then? You know, and I can intellectually talk to them, you know, on their level. And they'll tell me all their excuses and stories and reasons and problems and situations and circumstances. You know, and in the end I'll say, well, okay, I got it. Now let's pray. And I'll pray, well, Lord, you know, um, and they'll say, the Lord will say, take him to Burger King. I'll say, tell you what. I don't like McDonald's. I almost, I almost say I don't like McDonald's. I like McDonald's. But I'll say, hey, what? I'm feeling like Burger King. Let's go to Burger King. And they'll say, no. I'll say, okay. Can't help you. Because he, the Lord told me to take him to Burger King. 
But they didn't want to go to Burger King. They want to go to McDonald's. Now, they still got the same results, whether they admit it or not. But the Lord knows the heart of a person, and we only know the surface issues. Whatever it is that someone brings to you, don't react to that, but act upon what God tells you to do in every single circumstance. No matter how certain you are, you have the James 1.5 or Proverbs 3.5 or 6 or whatever it may be, you know, some certain particular favorite scripture that you just automatically flip to no matter what. Have you read your Bible today? I mean, I have my set routines, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm the same way. Someone comes to me and says, you know, I got a problem, I'll say, did you talk to your pastor? <laughs> you know, I'll just pass it off, man. You know, go away from me. I don't want to deal with it. You don't want to come to me for counseling because you'll get an answer. You know, the bottom line is, yes, we will be talking to the Lord, and yes, he will be speaking to you. There's no doubt about that part if you come to me for counseling, which is why people don't come to me for counseling. God knows they don't want to come to me because I'm like, oh boy, Lord, let's get them. <laughs> and I just can't wait to see what God may say. And he might say it through them to me. Michael, you need to shut up. Okay, I'm listening. You know, and I deal with it that way. But that's what the difference is between being the temple of the Holy Spirit and doing things as a temple of the Holy Spirit. If we just be rather than do, then God will inspire and bring to us words of life that we can share with others that would minister to them. And yet, if we do without His doing it in us or His speaking through us, then we may say the same words, but they won't have the same effect. They might even tick someone off or make them mad. They might even go off the deep end or do something worse, depending upon what the circumstances are. And that's why it must be the Word of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, working through the man of God to give to the person from God that is brought into your life so that there would be between you Jesus standing in the midst and he's waiting to see how you and that person are going to interact with each other because love has to be the motivational factor underneath it all there has to be the reason for why you're meeting together or sharing or declaring or preaching or teaching or giving some scripture or posting or liking or doing or doing any of these things and it has to be based upon God's love because otherwise it's based upon a nature that is not of God, but your own. So, for me, whenever I run into men of God or women of God, children of God, people that are in ministry, out of ministry, people that are doing or being or living or existing or those that are unsaved or saved, it doesn't matter what they are. I treat them all the same. They're all the same to me. Every single one of them. Jesus died for them. And that means a lot to me. Because I love Jesus more than anything else in my life. And because Jesus died for them, it's important to me to not misrepresent what Jesus would say to them. Because I fully expect Jesus to speak to them. Even as I write. Even as I speak. Even as I record videos. I have a absolute clutching faith on God that demands that he go through me and not me speak because in absolute sheer horror I would not do this without God but with God there is that absolute certainty of confidence that I require and I am fully expected that the living God speaks not through every single detail word that I spoke but speaks through me to the individual to meet their need that he would reveal himself to them even as I hope that those that have given platitudes and attitudes and dogmas and doctrines in some kind of superficial way though God may use it anyways I pray that that person or ministry or man or woman or child or anybody else that's doing that that they would consider the living God is aware of every word we speak and holds us accountable. So let us choose wisely to 
understand what people need, but better, what people should hear from the Lord than hear from our own ideas.